Thank you so much, Paulette, Leon, for this wonderful story and giving so much depth to this history. Uh, we have a final descendant story, and uh, this is Russell Lowe, who came from La Jolla, California. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. It's, it's my pleasure to be with you here today, and I want to thank the descendants for allowing you, allowing me to represent you. I'm going to tell you our family story, but in many respects, it's our story. And I've had the opportunity to meet many of you. You're my brothers and sisters. I hope to show you how we are more similar than anybody could possibly have imagined. We, the descendants, have a lot to be proud of. I think all Americans have something to be proud of. But. You and I, the descendants, share a common history that is truly rare and very few people can claim to be their own. However, we're not bound by this railroad or golden spike. Rather, I think we're bound by the courage and determination of our ancestors. And it's the determination and courage that lives on in each of you and is passed on to all of our future generations. Connie, you referred to this as the right stuff. And these men we're talking about truly had the right stuff. But it didn't end there. It got passed on to all of us. It got passed on to men like John C. Young, who in World War II did very heroic things in the China Burma Theater. Or Art Lim, who amazingly was the founder of the Flying Tigers. And of course, William Chow King, the highly decorated Flying Tiger. Now what's amazing is that these men are ancestors of people in the audience today. They're uncommon men who shared a common history by being uh, descendants of transcommunal railroad workers. It's really <coughs> amazing. They had the right stuff, the courage passed on to them. And I think there are brave men and women in all of our families. We're clearly not a timid people. And I just want that message to be loud and clear. And it's something that you know, I think we should all be quite proud of. In our family, there are men like Clifford Stanley Lowe, who at the very young age of 17, had to ask for his mother's permission to join the Army Air Corps in World War II. Uh, Stanley served as a B-24 uh, tail gunner in uh, New Guinea, in the South Pacific. He ultimately gave his life for his country. He did not come home, but it was not before he downed five Japanese zeros for which he was awarded the Silver Star. We're all very proud of Uncle Stanley. His older brother was Lauren, my father, and Lauren took part in the invasion of Saipan in the South Pacific, where tens of thousands of men lost their life in a few days. <coughs> a few days after the invasion, uh, the Japanese were mounting a bombing attack on a fuel dump, and they were attempting to destroy the uh, vital airfield. This, uh, the bombs they dropped succeeded in starting this huge fire that was within inches of igniting a 50,000 gallon tank of aviation fuel. Had this thing gone off, it would have been like an atomic bomb. The men, the men in this battalion were pinned down, there was molten metal, there was fire everywhere. And while the people were running away, Lauren Lode took a look at this and decided to act. He decided to act, he charged his bulldozer into that conflagration, putting out the fire and saving all the men in his battalion, and even more importantly, preserving the airfield, which would provide such an important ground base for the attacks on Japan from Saipan. Now, for his actions, Laura Lowe, who called this no big deal, was awarded the Silver Star for bravery in combat. Ultimately, the story of these two brothers really goes back 80 years before. And it begins with their grandparents, who 80 years before overcame exploitation and hardship to make a life for themselves and for the children in Gumsam. And it's that story I want to share with you. Uh, these are my great grandparents. Uh, Hung Lai Wo was the railroad worker. His wife was Tom Ying. And these are their five children who were born in San Francisco in the late 1800s. My grandmother is Zha Kui, second from the left. Uh, she's name is Kay. Her little sister is Chung Go. And the three boys, the little one in the middle is Ed Toon. The other boys are Bing and Kim. Kim's on the far right. and He was a very, very important person in our family history. He became the family historian. It was actually at his 100th birthday party that my sister Laurel, who's here today, went up to Uncle Kim and she says, Uncle Kim, please tell me about your father. You never talk about him. Well, his videotape reply was quite remarkable. This is totally unrehearsed by, by a 100-year-old. And what Uncle Kim said was, it so happened in my father's time, it was before the turn of the century, that Stanford, Crocker, and Huntington were commissioned to build the Central Pacific Railroad. In many months, they were getting nowhere with American labor. Every weekend, they went out on a binge, and nobody came back to work on Monday 
After many, many months, they'd only built about 27 miles. They said, this will never do. We'll have to go over and get some Chinese because if they could build the Great Wall, they could indeed build this railroad in no time. So he says, they got a lot of Chinese to come over here. Amongst them is my father and my uncle that was in that group. They finished building the Central Pacific Railroad in 1869, driving in the Golden Spike, completing the first Transcontinental Railroad. And he finishes by saying, my father came over, my uncle came over. Unfortunately, my uncle lost an eye in a blasting accident building the snowsheds towards Reno. Well, this is the first I had heard of this, and it truly was an eye-opener. It sort of was the beginning of my adventure in terms of looking into this part of our family history. It turns out Uncle Kim did a lot more. In 1978, he wrote a whole series of letters to the home village in China. And what he's doing is he's asking them about the family history. After he died, my cousin and I found these letters in, Chi in Chinese. We had them translated, and they don't mention the Transcontinental Railroad, but they do tell us all everything about the family history. One of my cousins in the village helped me to construct this uh, family tree in Chinese. And we also found this Hong family poem. Hong and Hong are the same things. And what this shows is the generation name. Every, every village in China had their own generation poem. My great grandfather was from the fifth generation, which is named Wa or Hong Wa. So that means that every man from this village of that generation who came to America was Hong Wa. Remember that name, it's gonna become quite important as we look forward here. Hung Lai Wo, my great-grandfather, was born in 1850 in Dai Long Village. His father was the famous Hung Long Yin, mother's Ham Shi, and they had five boys, Dak Wo, Wing Ji, Jik Wo, Lai Wo, and Fun Wo. And this is their village as it appeared in the 1970s and the location of that village in Toi Shan. I, I mentioned the name Hung Wo, and this is the Central Pacific Railroad payroll sheet from 1865. You notice it's pointing at Hung Wo. We believe this is likely someone from that village. Remember, all the men from this generation from that village had that name. He was one of the first people that was hired to work on the railroad, and indeed, he became a very important labor contractor. The two brothers immigrated in the mid-1860s. They came to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. They traveled 150 kilometers down to Canton, and then on to Canton, Hong Kong, where they boarded that Pacific Mail steamer, making the long trip to San Francisco, and eventually to Sacramento, where they joined up with the Central Pacific Railroad, and of course, worked on the snowsheds that Uncle Kim mentions. Now, one of the stories that my father told me about Hung <coughs> Lai Wo was that he found himself, Hung Lai Wo, in the middle of this trestle, he turned around and he saw a trained locomotive bearing down on himself. Because he couldn't run fast enough to get to the other end, he simply jumped over the side, hung onto the railroad tie for dear life as the, as the train rumbled overhead. True story, courtesy of my dad. <laughs> Interesting, my dad said he did the same thing years later. So it must be <laughs> something genetic about the right stuff, I think. Well, after Promontory Point, Hung Lai Wo eventually returned to San Francisco. Uh, about 1871, he worked in cigar factories. Later, we were told, owned a cigar store and also worked as a cook. Now, the other important person in the story is his wife, Tom Ying, Hong Tom Shi. Uh, she was born in 1871, Boxar Village. She came to the U.S. in 1880, but she did not come of her own free will. Rather, she was brought here as a servant girl, and she was rescued by missionaries in San Francisco. She went to live with them at the Occidental Board Home for Chinese Girls, later renamed the Cameron House. This is also a theme that's very common in all of our lives. These servants girls were, were uh, the reason we're all here today, it turns out. Most of these Chinese men after the railroad did not have wives. There were very few women. The ratio was 27 to 1, men to women. Hung Lai Wo had other ideas. He wanted to find a wife, so he went to the Cameron House, and after intensive grilling, about his character and his religion, they finally let him meet Tom Ying. She agreed to marry him, and uh, she, after they were married in 1888, she worked as a seamstress throughout her life using the skills she learned at the Cameron House, and later also worked as a midwife, according to Kim, bringing many Chinese babies into the world in Chinatown before the turn of the century. This is where she lived in, in China. These are my grandparents in the late 1800s, and the first thing you might notice is how tall my grandfather was. I think this really disproves the myth about the short statured Chinese railroad worker. Truly not, not the case here. Now, the Hung family lived in Chinatown, San Francisco, initially on Commercial Street, and then later on 920 Sacramento Street, which amazingly was only about a block away from where she started at the Cameron House. These are the five children who you've met. Now this photo from 1903 is probably the last time the family was together. Their family is about to be torn apart. 
Chinatown, because of the Exclusion Act of the 1900s, was in decline. There was very little food and certainly not enough money to go around. That same year, Kay had to go off and get married. Very young. She married my grandfather and moved off to Salem. And when my sister asked her how she could possibly marry someone so much older, she replied matter-of-factly, because I got married, they could feed my sister. That's what it was like then. The next year, 1904, the two boys went away. Bing and Kim went to Montana to live with that uncle. Maybe the uncle with one eye. They went off dressed in that Chinese garb that you saw. The next December, their father died of berry berry, which means he didn't have much to eat except for rice. And a few months later, in April, basically the earthquake destroyed their home, Chinatown, and much of San Francisco. Chung Go, the second daughter, took care of her ill father after Kay was married and the boys went off to Montana. With their mother, she had a seamstress business making clothes for the Chinese workers. And in 1910, at the age of 15, she married and had three children. A little Ed uh, survived the earthquake, and he, with his mother and Chung Go, they moved to Oakland, as many Chinese did. He later went to New York City and married an Irish woman. They had a daughter in the 1930s who had lost track of, unfortunately. This is Ed, a remarkable transformation. You can see what happened just two, two decades there. Being, Bing uh, is the, the uh, oldest boy, and he was 12 years old when they went to Kalispell, Montana. He actually became a chef, and I found him in the census in 1910 as the assistant cook in Whitefish, Montana, clearly where he learned to, to cook. He served as a chef in resorts and hotels for the rest of his life, and Bing also making the transformation a couple decades later. <laughs> Hong Kim Sung, the person that we really owe much of this story to, was quite important. He was only 10 when he went off to Kalispell, Montana. He went to the American school where he told stories about having to fight off the white boys who were pulling on his cue all the time. In fact, he cut off his cue early because he just got fed up with it. He um, worked in the, uh, his uncle's store and at the Bong Tong restaurant, and both boys sent all of their money, $60 every month, home to Oakland to take care of the family. In 1910, he went to Salem, Oregon, which is where his sister was. He went to high school there, and eventually they sent him to UC Berkeley, where he was the first Chinese American to graduate in the degree in engineering. In in 1919, he married Marion Wong. Marion Wong is quite famous in her own right. Look her up. She was actually the first Chinese American film producer in this country. First. In 1916, she wrote, produced, and starred in The, the Ghost of Gong Guan. That was discovered in reels of it just recently. This is Kim at his 100th birthday celebration with three of his children. On his left, on the right side of the image, is Arabella Hong, his daughter, who went to Juilliard and starred as the initial, the very first Helen Child in the Broadway production of The Flower Drum Song. Just a beautiful voice. So they have a pretty remarkable family. And my grandmother, Kate, she went off very young. In 1903, she got married. She lived with Lo Sun Fook, my grandfather, and he treated her like the, uh, the rare jewel she was. They lived at the Hop Lee Laundry, which is the family name they assumed. They also owned poultry stores and dry goods stores, and amazingly, they owned five hop farms in the Willamette Valley at a time when Chinese could not own anything, and we believe they probably were in her name. They had 10 children between 1904 and 1925, as you see here, and Hop Lee, as he was called, had a very progressive ed attitude about education. He said, that all of my children will go to college, even the girls. The people in Salem laughed at him, but he did it. His oldest, Elsie, the tall one there, was the first Chinese woman to graduate from Willamette University. Ella, next to her, went to UC Berkeley. And little Isabel here, below them, was one of the very first Chinese-American women to become a physician in this country. The boys studied aeronautical engineering and uh, chemistry. And my dad, little Lauren there, was the Silver Star recipient in World War II. The children who were born after this include Leslie, whose, whose uh, children are here. Leslie was actually the first physician in the family and also went to the Korean War. My dad, you've met. Stanley was the one who didn't come home from the war, but we certainly remember his contribution. And little Mei Mei here went off to college and became a medical technologist. This final image here is labeled Must Be China, but that's, of course that's my dad in Salem, Oregon, dressed up. <laughs> now. If we fast forward 100 years to today, there are over 100 descendants of Hung Lai Wo and Tom, Sh uh, Tom uh, Shi, and we contribute to American society in every imaginable walk of life, just as your families do. 
And in the current generation, the great-great-grandchildren, there are doctors, nurses, a, a neuroscientists, psychologists, professional dancers. We have two Eagle Scouts and a state championship athlete. And amazingly, or maybe not amazingly, that the courage of the ancestors, the right stuff continues to show itself. We see it in my, my cousin down here, uh, Cousin Courtney, who is one of the few F-15 fighter pilots in the United States Air Force. In addition, we see it in my son Ryan, who at the age of 10 decided to act. He swam a quarter mile through the raging Pacific surf off of San Simeon to rescue a father and son who were being pulled off by rip currents. Truly amazing. These are people who do have the right stuff, and I think it's certainly in all of us. But in our family, we can trace all of our roots back to these two people. A teenage Chinese boy who came to the country to work on a railroad, and a Chinese servant girl who was rescued by missionaries. We owe them a lot. It was certainly their ability to overcome hardship and exploitation that is not only a Chinese-American story, it's truly an American story. Thank you.